is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition with Francine Lockwood. Good morning and welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Tom McKenzie in London. Here's what's coming up on today's program. The chips are down. Intel gives one of the gloomiest forecasts in the company's history. After reporting a sales miss, we'll bring you the pre-market share price in just a moment. The US economy posts a mild slowdown at the end of 2022, but beats expectations, providing encouraging signs for the Fed's fight against inflation and touting the potential of Brexit amid rising criticism just 20 minutes from now, the UK Chancellor of the Exchequer, Jeremy Hunt, will lay out his plans to boost the British economy in a speech here at Bloomberg's European headquarters. He then joins us for an interview the following hour with Anna Edwards. Let's check in on these markets then. A bit of a turnaround in terms of sentiment. It's been a bit of a choppy trading session across Europe. We'll have a look at the European benchmark shortly. We are bringing you, of course, the story when it comes to Adani. Those equities, those stocks, as part of that conglomerate, remain under pressure. The Indian markets were closed yesterday, so it's a bit of a catch-up reaction. And, of course, this group and executives have said they're going to look potentially at legal action against Hindenburg Research and also pushing back very, very strongly on those claims of mismanagement and fraud that have been put forward by that research group and that short seller. But nonetheless, the stocks are under pressure. This is one of the biggest companies within that conglomerate that is listing. You can see that reflected. NASDAQ futures pointing lower by six tenths of a percent. A bit of profit taking, you would assume, given the run up that we've seen. Gains of 2% on the close yesterday, an 11% rally for Tesla. And broadly within the tech space, at least within the investor community, yesterday looking past the travails of Intel. And that's a story we'll unpack in more detail for you. A sell off across the Treasury market. Markets, just modestly yields up four basis points on the 10 year, 353. Japanese yen strengthening three tenths of a percent as inflation in Tokyo comes to early 1980s highs. Just again putting pressure on the BOJ to reconsider its yield curve control. Across the map, then, modest gains here in the UK, almost flat, just up about a tenth of a percent. There is an energy component here. The sectors, in terms of some of the leading gains, energy. Brent is up about eight tenths of a percent the last time I checked. The DAX gaining a tenth of a percent. Over in France, a similar picture. And the geopolitics back in focus again with the news that the Netherlands and Japan will be aligning with the US on further restrictions of chip technology to China. The FTSE mid putting in a slightly better performance, gaining two tenths of a percent over in Italy. Let's have a quick look then at the Intel pre-market price. Oh, look at that, down more than 10%. Again, a very grim forecast from this business. They're going through a restructuring plan. They're having to spend heavily on new facilities and new factories. And at the same time, they see a steep drop in PC demand. And the forecast going forward is very disappointing for investors. Of course, you can see that reflected in that price. A very dire picture, at least in terms of the pre-market picture for Intel on that forecast. And again, slowing PC demand. Whether or not this cloud business can kick in to gear in the second half of the year is a key question for Intel. Right, let's get back to the US economy. Beating expectations in the last quarter of 2022. Slowing slightly, but still expanding at a pretty healthy clip. 2.9% annualised rate. We are joined now by Anika Trion, Chief Economist at Van Lanschot Kumpen. Anika, thank you for joining us this morning. I want to get your views then on, on the transparency we're getting, at least the clarity around the US economy. You lift the hood. The concern from Bloomberg Economics is that the consumer, that engine within the US US economy is starting to lose steam. Do you share that concern? Well, absolutely. And, you know, you've got this constant um, dilemma because on one hand at the margin, again, look at the latest reported GDP, actually better versus expectations. On the other hand, watch the leading indicators. And like with many other developed countries, we're now seven months in, in consistent declines in leading indicators. And your point about the consumer, we, we fully agree with that. What you're seeing is consumer expenditure, which has held up relatively well thus far, has been fueled by dissaving, so eating up into savings, which is not sustainable. What about the view then that at the top line you have GDP coming in slightly stronger than expected? You have a job market that remains relatively resilient and the inflation has started to peak in the US and therefore you are starting to see the outlines at least of this soft landing for the Fed. You push back on that narrative, do you? Yeah, and I think that, that's exactly what's been fueling the markets thus far. So year mm. to date, we've had a phenomenal start to the markets. And the reason for that is this talk of Fed pivot has gained a lot of fuel. 
So, you know, the market is anticipating rates um, cuts already in second half 2023. Year-end 2023, rate expectations of the market are below what the Fed themselves are putting out there. And, you know, that gap is the story of 2022. That gap is the story, actually, of, uh, of 2023. We think it's far too early to already price in a Fed pivot, given stickiness around inflation and, more importantly, um, around credibility issues that central banks such as the Fed have to remedy. What are the leading indicators here in Europe telling us about the prospects for this, for this European economy and whether indeed it can weather and survive and get through the year without a recession? I mean, I think, again, part of the reason why markets have been so strong, especially the European outperformance year to date, there has been, it's been an amazing job to see how successful you know, the developments of gas, natural gas storage levels have been in Europe. It's been such a successful job. We're actually above the normal sort of level of storage corridor. And that's been very, very helpful in terms of European economy, European recession risks, because, you know, the major energy crisis we were all fearing, energy rationing, mm. that seems further and further away from us. So that's very helpful for a European picture. Having said that, again, look at the weakness from a consumer perspective. You know, real wage declines are even more of an issue in Europe versus the U.S., and there are some other fundamental issues. And what, what doesn't help there is that the central bank in Europe, the ECB, is actually behind the curve versus the Fed. You know, it's still very strongly yeah. on its hiking path. And we haven't even started QT. We haven't even started quantitative tightening, which starts in March. Well, the, well, and, and, the, and the quantitative tightening element is, is something of an unknown as, uh, as well, isn't it? There's a, there's a survey by Bloomberg of economists, uh, and the majority now see the ECB hiking, to your point, uh, two 50 basis point hikes coming through before pausing. Does the European economy, can it stomach a further 100 basis points of hikes? Well, I think, you know, the energy crisis point is crucial, because had that gone out of control, had we not been so successful in those gas storage situations, it could have been a really gloomy outlook for Europe and a massive dilemma for the ECB to figure out how do you combat inflation without bringing a very hard landing. So I think that, that's a big relief. Um, so that's why a lot of people are talking about a mild recession instead of a heavy recession in Europe. And, you know, we simply have to continue to track the data to see how, how things are progressing. OK. Annika Trion, Chief Economist at Van Lanschot Kempen. Thank you very much indeed for joining us this Friday. Have a great weekend. Thank you for the analysis. Coming up, the UK's Chancellor of the Exchequer is expected to outline plans to tackle sluggish growth. That's in a speech due to begin shortly here at Bloomberg's European headquarters. We're going to bring you more on that, of course. And we're going to be speaking with Jeremy Hunt afterwards on Bloomberg TV. Do not miss that conversation. 10.30 a.m. UK time. This is Bloomberg. Economics, finance, politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Tom McKenzie in London. Let's get to the Bloomberg First Word News now with Leanne Gerens. Leanne. Tom, good morning. Bloomberg has learned that Japan and the Netherlands are set to join the US in limiting China's access to advanced chip-making machinery. We're told that officials from the two countries will conclude talks on the details as soon as today. The joint effort will further undercut Beijing's ambitions to build its own domestic microchip capabilities. Now, the US economy beat expectations in the final quarter of 2022. GDP rose at an annualized pace of 2.9%, cooling from 3.2% in the third quarter. Some economists said there were warning signs in the data, especially in the weakening consumer demand, to suggest that a U.S. recession remains a big risk this year. Now, shares in Adani Group companies are lower today, extending a sell-off that began after a short seller Hindenburg Research published a report accusing the firms of fraud. After Indian markets were closed yesterday, Adani Enterprises' 
lost as much as 6% in early trading in Mumbai this morning, with some group stocks down as much as 15%. Adani has firmly refuted the allegations, and Bloomberg understands the company plans to issue a further detailed response, which should come later today. Global News, 24 hours a day, on air and on Bloomberg QuickSeg, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Leanne Gerrans. This is Bloomberg. Tom. Leanne, thank you very much indeed. Right, coming up, the UK's Chancellor of the Exchequer is expected to outline plans to tackle sluggish growth in a speech due to begin shortly here at Bloomberg's European headquarters. We will bring you more on that, of course. And we're going to be sitting down speaking with Jeremy Hunt afterwards. That is with Anna Edwards on Bloomberg Television. Do not miss that conversation. 10.30 a.m. UK time. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back. UK Chancellor Jeremy Hunt is set to outline his plans to boost the British economy in a speech shortly here at Bloomberg's European headquarters. Let's bring in Bloomberg's chief Europe economist, Jamie Rush, then, who has been, of course, always in the weeds on the UK economy as well as the broader European economy. Jamie, I want to start by stepping back a little bit and getting our viewers up to speed on just where the UK economy stands with the data that we've seen year to date. Is there a bit of resilience that we're starting to see now in the UK economy? I think it's right to say that the economy has held up better than most people expected in the face of the energy shock. And now, of course, things are changing very fast. Energy prices are about half what they were in December uh, in wholesale markets. And this is, turning, this is changing the outlook. It means that any recession is likely to be much more shallow than people previously anticipated. And therefore, the economy is going to be a bit stronger. Does it give the Chancellor a little bit more dry powder as well? Could we be looking at a Chancellor who is now in a position to start either ramping up spending or cutting taxes? I think that's extremely unlikely. So what matters for the public finances is the long-term outlook for GDP growth. And we heard earlier this week that the OBR is down, or is likely to downgrade its medium-term growth forecast, leaving less money to spend on services and less room to cut taxes. So I think, I mean, I've seen more black holes in the public finances than Stephen Hawking, I think, but this is just another one. And they're going to have, we're going to have to hear how he's responding to it. Unfortunately, it's unlikely he's going to be able to grow his way out of this problem. What, what, is, the, what is the prescription then? It's, it's clearly very, very challenging, as you allude to there. Are, the, are there obvious things that the Chancellor can reach for, at least if not to accelerate and turbocharge this economy, at least reduce the damage to some extent? Are there are some obvious things that this Chancellor can reach for. Well, if you look at one of the, the reasons why our economy is growing more slowly than our G7 peers, it's partly because business investment has been incredibly weak. There's like a 20% shortfall since Brexit relative mm. to G7 average. Um, what, what are companies not like? They don't like uncertainty. So I think what we really need to do is end the corrosive uncertainty about our position in Europe. Uh, and obviously polit the political situation hasn't helped either. So I, I think that's the first thing that they can actually do to, to lift investment. But the fruits of any growth plan are going to be born many years in, in ahead, not, not in the next five years. OK, and we're seeing live pictures now of Grant Shapps uh, here at the Bloomberg European headquarters ahead of the Chancellor of the Exchequer. Of course, he'll be taking the podium just in the next few minutes. When he talks, and exactly around the question of Brexit, we've had this preview that suggests he's going to be talking about the benefits of Brexit. I think you can objectively say that we haven't seen much evidence of the benefits of Brexit to this, to this point. What do you think he's going to nod to around what Brexit allows us to do that could be a stimulus to this economy? Well, I'm, I'm on tenter hooks. Yeah. <laughs> I've got no idea how he's going to dress that up. I mean, we know what we, what we can identify fairly clearly is the cost. We can see what's happened to, to investment. We can see what's happened to GDP relative mm. to peers. We can see what's happened to productivity. Um, for me, it seems pretty unlikely we're going to get a major change in those trends in the next year or two. I mean, the car industry, that was a reminder this week as well. Just the crushing blow to the auto industry, particularly since 2016. And guess what? That aligns with that, mm. with that Brexit vote. The manufacturing sector of the UK being hollowed out. Is there an acceptance, basically, here that manufacturing is not coming back to the UK, that we have to continue to focus on services? Or is there, is there an opportunity around manufacturing if there is the right policy prescription, the right plan put in place? I mean, it's, you're absolutely right to single out the automotive industry. I and mean, obviously, there's been huge supply 
chain constraints as well. But it's much harder to do business and, and you have moved things across borders. Um, so it's hard to imagine the car industry is going to recover in, you know, in a meaningful way. Uh, long term, though, I, no, I don't think they're going to ditch manufacturing as part of the, the plan for growth. I think it's, the, 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 there's a global trend towards reshoring um, supply chains, towards being a bit more resilient domestically on, on the things that we produce. Um, so I think he'll be headed that way, but I, I, the problem is you've got to throw some money at it and there isn't any sign that that's what they're going to do. Okay, step back a little bit to the macro then, and you touched on the recession, and you think it's going to be a slightly milder recession. So you're, you're, you and the team still think there is going to be a recession here in the UK, but it'll be slightly milder, is that correct? That's right. Okay. So, I mean, but certainly we think growth stagnated in 4Q seems likely, and then the first couple of quarters in the year, as we see the, the persistence of that, that shock to real incomes really, really hitting ha uh, household consumption. But it, mild. Mild recession. Money, must market, be up. money market's pricing in a cut from the BOE by the end of this year. Is that, is that realistic? Back down from 4.5% to 4.25% for the terminal rate by the end of this year? I think it's pretty... I don't think it's plausible. I mean, I think it's, it's more likely you don't get to 4.5% hmm. and that they, they, they pause earlier and then stay on hold for longer. Um, but, of course, but, you know, we'll be subject to global developments. If there's a recession in the US, you know, we're not going to be immune to that. So if that, if that breaks out in the second half of the year, that may be why people are starting to think that there'll be a, a cut here. We were unpacking the GDP data out of the US earlier today, and part of that, and part of the concern from, from your colleague stateside, was, was the weakness that started to come through for the consumer. Mm. Are we seeing a similar story play out here in the UK? I mean, the context is different because of the squeeze on incomes yeah. is obviously quite different. And, you know, in the US, they've been compensated much better with higher wage growth. Um, but, you know, I would expect that we are going to see some weakness creeping in. We already see the labour market is starting to cool a little bit. Vacancies are tipping down. So we are at a hinge point for the UK economy. The question is how quickly do we do, do, do so things So that household balance sheet, that, that, is a bit, that, is, that is a similarity with the US. Different components feeding into that, but there's always yeah. been a bit of a nod. OK, households do have a bit of resilience in terms of the balance. Is that starting to erode? How much, how much more space do households and families have to kind of tie themselves over? Uh, some households right. have it, right? Yes. So it's, like, it's, it's certainly true that that buffer still exists and, and households are beginning to, to dip into it, but only those who have been able to save, which is the upper quartiles of the income distribution during the pandemic. Um, those who don't have savings, I mean, this is just going to be catastrophic as it, as it continues to be. So I, I think it, there's a clear, a clear split in the UK and that's going to be manifest at a macro level, but you won't see it as... as as substantially. And, and you talked in some detail at the start of this conversation about the benefits of slowing, at least easing energy prices. Where does that leave your forecast for, for inflation here in the UK by, by year end? So we're, we're now expecting inflation to be down to about 3% by the end of the year, um, which is obviously a big turnaround from 10, 11% that we've seen recently. Very big, yeah. Um, and it is led by that, that drop in energy costs. Uh, so, so there's good news there. It's just we need to get through this next couple of quarters and then see where we are. OK, tying that back then to your, to your analysis around the BOE. Does the BOE, can the BOE live with, with 3%? It's not their target, but can they, if they don't nod to it officially, can they, can they accept that maybe inflation around 3% is the new normal? I, I think they'll, they'll be increasingly comfortable as as inflation heads down to 3%. And for me, 3%, even 4% for next year would be a really great outcome. Like, that would be, that would be good. Um, yeah. Especially if it's led by, by wage growth. Um, but for the bank, obviously, they're just going to keep talking about 2%. And they, the, now is not the time to revisit inflation targets, not when inflation expectations are so loosely anchored. So they're going to stick with 2%. They're going to talk a tough game. But privately, I would imagine they'd be, they'd be fairly comfortable with inflation at three. You are, of course, our chief European economist. So I want to get you to tie the European story to, to, to the UK then. And increasingly, the debate that maybe Europe manages to get through 2023 without hitting a recession. And of course, a big part of that, again, will be the energy story. Does, does, does that align with, 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 with your view? And therefore, what is the impact on... To what extent does that, does that provide a little bit of ballast, at least, for the UK? Yeah, it will. I mean, so we've revised up our Eurozone forecast. We've taken the recession out. So, you know, the, it's, it's been astonishing. The, the, the warmer winter, there's 40% there's more gas in storage than on average over the past four, five years at this, at this point. Um, it bodes well for this winter and next winter, and that's why gas prices have fallen. That's going to be, and, and for, well, for the Eurozone, it passes through more quickly to inflation as well for some countries. They do it differently uh, relative to how we do it here in the UK. So, uh, yes, the Eurozone's looking, looking better. Uh, some countries will benefit from the China reopening as well. Um, and, yeah, some of that benefit will pass through to the UK over the coming year. It's obvious to point when you look across Europe at the beneficiaries of that China reopening, whether it's the, the auto space or, or chemicals or luxury, 
is where, where does the benefit of a reopened China play out for the UK? Is it the tourism trade or is, it, is there more to it than that? Is there a manufacturing boost that comes with that? Uh, I wouldn't say it's a huge manufacturing boost, maybe a little bit. I mean, Germany is the country which will benefit the most in the, among the EU countries. Um, but really, I mean, who's going to benefit from China? It's Saudi, it's, uh, it's, it's Australia, it's like the commodities exporters. They're the ones who really benefit from the China reopening. But um, we'll, get some, we'll get some updraft. From, yeah. from, from the... when, when, we talk, when we talk about China, we think, we think about semiconductors and the news today that there's going to be further restrictions. And then that ties us to the Bloomberg scoop about this government outlining some support for UK semiconductors. That an example of a hands-on approach, they would argue long-term planning to shore up the resilience of the mm. UK's latent tech genius and tech strength. Is, is, is that an example of what this government can do within all of the constrictions and limitations that you've outlined for us? Yeah, I mean, one thing I'll say is I mean, the UK is at the forefront of innovation. It's just the trouble is we don't tend to monetize it all that well. Mm. Um, so there is space there to do something. But, the other, the, but there's also a question of scale here. Like what they're doing in the US with the Inflation Reduction Act, which is basically green subsidies, uh, what the EU might be cooking up over the coming six months, they're going to dwarf probably what the UK is likely to do because we haven't heard anything about fresh, fresh cash for that. So I think we're, the risk, the, we are at risk of being left behind on the green transition. We're still at risk of being left behind on the green transition. Matt Clifford, by the way, chief executive and co-founder of Entrepreneur First, is who you can see at the podium right now as we wait for the UK Chancellor, of course, to give that speech at Bloomberg's European headquarters. And just a reminder as well, Anna Edwards of Bloomberg TV, of course, will be sitting down and having a conversation with the UK Chancellor at around 10.30 a.m. UK time. So we'll take the speech. And then Anna will have that interview with the UK Chancellor. So really worth sticking around for both of those components. Let's bring back Jamie Rush then and that comment on the UK being left behind in terms of the shift to renewables. And of course, we're all waking up, we're still adjusting to, to, the, to the enormity of the Inflation Reduction Act out of the US. And you see officials in Brussels scrambling for a European response. Uh, is, is, a response is needed from Whitehall. I, I, think, it, I think it is, yeah. Um, the, I mean, the Europeans, the, the EU is likely to do something reasonably substantial, I would think, because Europe has already made quite a lot of headway in, um, in green technology and attracting those businesses and, and developing those businesses. So it stands to lose a lot um, from, the, from, the US, uh, from the US attracting talent and, and business across the pond. So, I mean, the UK really needs to form some sort of strategy around this. And um, unfortunately, that means some money, some subsidies. Um, needs to be put, put in, otherwise we are going to be, we're going to be buying the technology that other people come up with, but not going to be producing it ourselves. Are you surprised by the resilience of, of the pound, 123 on sterling? Because it has a tie into to the inflation input as well. Um, I'm, I'm not hugely surprised. I mean, I think that if you, the, the main driver of the, monetary pol of the, uh, the exchange rate outlook has been monetary policy over the past, mm. past year, with the exception of that moment in October and November, which I won't mention. Um, <laughs> So I, I think it just reflects the, you know, a growing acceptance that the Bank, the bank of England is going to have to, to raise to rates that are close-ish to what the Fed's doing at you know, 5% or so. Um, so it, you know, it reflects But it, it, it does offset, does it, does it offset some of the inflation input as well, given we, given we import so much? Yeah, it does, but it, it's, it's fairly second order compared to okay. the, major, the major problems. If you think, like, what are the problems with inflation in the UK? Well, one of them is we've got wage growth at 7%. I mean, that's going to be, that's, that's going to be driving up inflation in the medium term. Uh, the economy is obviously, as I said, looking more resilient. That's going to drive up risk to inflation in the medium term as well. So, I mean, the news recently is basically all going to be leading the Bank of England to, to be feeling more, more hawkish in the near term, at least. And that, of course, ex helps explain why the currency is, uh, is, is holding okay, up. Okay, you, you avoided it, but it was the moron, the moron premium of that, uh, of that mini budget, of course, of, of Liz Truss and the former uh, UK Chancellor, Kwasi, uh, Kwasi Kwarteng. And some, some of that moron premium ha has come off, particularly within, within guilt. Um, it ju just in terms of the, the prospects, again, the labour market, the labour market tightness is a conversation we have when we reflect on the US, but also here in the... What do you see? How does this UK labour market shape up towards, towards the end of this year? You are forecasting recession. It's going to be shallow. What does the labour market look like at end of 2023? How much damage do you expect to see? I, so, I mean, the, the shallowness of the recession kind of speaks to, speaks to the, the point about the labour market, which we think it'd be unemployment will rise a little bit over the coming quarters, like maybe half a percentage point. Um, will that be enough to take the heat out of, the, uh, out of, the, out of, the, out of wages? Um, OK. Not on its own. Jamie, you've been an absolute star. I've been peppering you with questions. Let's cross over now to the UK Chancellor of the Exchequer, Jeremy Hunt.
uh, with that speech for here that welcome. at Thank Bloomberg. Thank you, Con, for having us. Thank you all for joining us at Bloomberg. From the way we communicate and collaborate to the way we buy and sell goods and services, digital technology has transformed nearly every aspect of our economic lives. How do I know that? Because I too, just like Matt, asked ChatGPT to craft the opening lines <laughs> of this speech. And who needs politicians when you've got AI? Like other countries, the UK has been dealing with economic headwinds caused by a decade of black swan events. A financial crisis, a pandemic, and then an international energy crisis. And my party understands better than others the importance of low taxes in creating incentives and fostering the animal spirits that spur economic growth. But another conservative insight is that risk-taking by individuals and businesses can only happen when governments provide economic and financial stability. So the best tax cut right now is a cut in inflation. And the plan I set out in the autumn statement tackles that root cause of instability in the British economy. The Prime Minister talked about halving inflation as one of his five key priorities. And doing so is the only sustainable way to restore industrial harmony. But today I want to talk about his second priority, to grow the economy. And just in case you weren't completely sure of that, I've helpfully put it up <laughs> on a screen behind me. We want to be one of the most prosperous countries in Europe. And today I'm going to outline the four pillars of our plan to get there. Just as our plan to halve inflation will require patience and discipline, so too will our plan for prosperity and growth. But it's also going to need something else which is in rather short supply, optimism that we can get there. Just this month, columnists from both left and right have talked about an existential crisis, Britain teetering on the edge, and that all we can hope for is that things don't get worse. I welcome the debate, but chancellors too are allowed their say. And I say simply this, declinism about Britain is just wrong. It's always been wrong in the past, and it's wrong today. Some of the gloom is based on statistics that don't reflect the whole picture. Like every G7 country, our growth was slower in the years after the financial crisis than before it. But since 2010, the UK has grown faster than France, Japan and Italy, not at the bottom, but right in the middle of the pack. Since the Brexit referendum, we've grown at about the same rate as Germany. Yes, we've not returned to pre-pandemic employment or output levels, but an economy that contracted 20% in a pandemic still has nearly the lowest unemployment for half a century. And whilst our public sector continues to recover more slowly than we would like from the pandemic, strengthening the case for reform, our private sector has grown 7.5% in the last year. Yes, inflation has risen, but it's still lower than in 14 EU countries, with interest rates rising more slowly than in the US or Canada. And yes, we have to improve our productivity, but output per hour worked is now higher than pre-pandemic. And last week, a survey of business leaders by PwC said the UK was the third most attractive country for CEOs expanding their businesses. Economists and journalists know you can spend a long time arguing the toss on statistics. But the strongest grounds for optimism comes not from debating this or that way of analysing data, but from what we've been hearing about this morning, our long-term prospects. Because when it comes to the innovation industries that will shape and define this century, the UK is powerfully positioned to play a leading role. Let's just look at some of them. In digital technology, as we heard from Michelle, we have become only the third economy in the world with a trillion dollar sector. We've created more unicorns than France and Germany combined with eight UK cities now home to two or more unicorns. 
the London-Oxford-Cambridge Triangle has the largest number of tech businesses in the world outside San Francisco and New York. PwC say that UK GDP will be up to 10% higher in 2030 because of AI alone. FinTech attracted more funding last year than anywhere in the world outside the US. Or life sciences, where we also have the largest sector in Europe and a brilliant advocate with our superb science minister, George Freeman. We produced one of the world's first COVID vaccines, estimated to have saved more than 6 million lives worldwide. We identified the treatment most widely used to save lives in hospitals, saving more than a million lives across the globe. We're behind only the US and China in terms of high quality life science papers published and every one of the world's top 25 biopharmaceutical firms has operations in the UK. Another big growth area is our green and clean energy sector. The UK is a world leader here with the largest offshore wind farm in the world. Last year we were able to generate an incredible 40% of our electricity from renewables. And on one day, a rather windy December the 30th, we actually got 60% of our electricity from renewables, mainly wind. McKinsey estimate that the global market opportunity for UK green industries could be worth more than a trillion pounds between now and 2030. And we're proceeding with a new plant at Sizewell C, led by our brilliant business secretary who also spoke very wisely and surprisingly classically earlier on. Um, and I could also talk about our creative industries, which employ over 2 million people, grew at twice the rate of the UK economy in the last decade, and have made the UK the world's largest exporter of unscripted TV formats, helped give us a top three spot in the Portland Soft Power Index. Or our advanced manufacturing sector, key to exports, where we produce around half the world's large civil aircraft wings and its biggest aero engines, as well as around half the world's Formula One Grand Prix cars. And the golden thread running through the industries where Britain does best is innovation. Amongst the world's largest economies, the Global Innovation Index ranks us fourth globally. Those innovation industries now account for around a quarter of our output. They've been responsible for nearly all our productivity growth since 1997. And they're also the reason that all of you are here. In the audience, we've got leaders from Meta, Microsoft, Amazon, Apple and Google, the world's largest tech companies, all with major operations in the UK. We've got Monzo and Revolut, shining examples from our world-beating fintech sector. We have founders and CEOs from one of some of our most exciting UK technology companies like Proximy and Matilon. You are vital for Britain's economic future, but Britain is vital for your future too. So I want to ask all of you to help our country achieve something that is both ambitious and strategic. I want to ask you to help turn the UK into the world's next Silicon Valley. What do I mean by that? If anyone is thinking of starting or investing in an innovation or technology centered business, I want them to do it here. I want the world's tech entrepreneurs, life science innovators and green tech companies to come to the UK because it offers the best possible place to make their visions happen. And if you do, we will put at your service, not just British ingenuity, but British universities to fuel your innovation, Britain's financial sector to fund it, and a British government that will back you to the hilt. Our universities are ranked second globally for their quality and include three of the world's top 10. In order to support the groundbreaking work they do in so many new fields, the government has protected our £20 billion research budget, now at the highest level in history. And as you look for funding to expand, we offer one of the world's top two financial hubs and the world's largest net exporter of financial services. The capability of the City of London, combined with the research strengths of our universities, 
makes our aspiration to be a technology superpower not just ambitious, but achievable. And today I'm here to say the government is determined to make it happen. But like any business embracing new opportunities, we should also be straight about our weaknesses. Structural issues like poor productivity, skills gaps, low business investment, and the over-concentration of wealth in the Southeast have led to uneven and lower growth. Real incomes haven't risen by as much as they could as a result. Confidence in the future, though, starts with honesty about the present. So we want to be one of the most prosperous countries in Europe. And today I want to set out our plan to address those issues. That plan, our plan for growth, is necessitated, energised and made possible by Brexit. The desire to move to a high-wage, high-skill economy is one that's shared on all sides of that debate. And we need to make Brexit a catalyst for the bold choices that will take advantage of the nimbleness and flexibilities that it makes possible. So this is a plan for growth. It's not a series of measures or announcements, which we'll have to wait, I'm afraid, for budgets and autumn statements in the years ahead. But this plan is a framework against which individual policies will be assessed and taken forward. And I set out that plan, those priorities, under four pillars. They build on the people, capital, ideas themes set out by the Prime Minister last year in his May's lecture. And as such are the pillars essential for any modern innovation-led economy. For ease of memory, the four pillars all happen to start with the letter E, the four E's of economic growth and prosperity. And they are enterprise, education, employment, and everywhere. So let's start with the first E, which is enterprise. If we're to be Europe's most prosperous economy, we need to have, quite simply, its most dynamic and productive companies. Now, there's a wide range of literature citing the importance of entrepreneurship on business dynamism, whereby more productive firms enter and grow and less productive firms shrink. But I don't just believe the theory, I've put it into practice. I set up and ran my own business for 14 years. It was one of the best decisions I ever made. And I actually owe it to Margaret Thatcher and Nigel Lawson. Because by the time I got to university and was thinking about my career options, they had changed attitudes towards entrepreneurship. Had they not, I would probably have ended up in the city or the civil service. Instead, I took a different route to end up in the Treasury, less the fast stream, more the long way round. But like thousands of others setting up on their own, I learned to take calculated risks, to live with uncertainty, and to work through failures, of which there were many. Every big business was a startup once. And we won't build the world's next Silicon Valley unless we nurture battalions of dynamic new challenger businesses. Today, we are already ranked by the World Bank as one of the best places to do business amongst large European nations, second only to America in the G7. And the result of that pro-business climate is that since 2010, we've created more than a million new businesses in this country. But the question I want to ask is, how are we going to generate the next million? And firstly, we need lower taxes. In Britain, even after recent tax rises, we have one of the lowest levels of business tax as a proportion of GDP amongst major countries. But we should be explicit. High taxes directly affect the incentives which determine decisions by entrepreneurs, investors, or larger companies about whether to pursue their ambitions in Britain. With volatile markets and high inflation, sound money must come first. But our ambition should be to have nothing less than the most competitive tax regime of any major country. That means restraint on spending. In case anyone is in any doubt about who will actually deliver that restraint, 
to make a low tax economy possible. I gently point out that in the three weeks since Labour promised no big government checkbook, they've made £45 billion of unfunded spending commitments. But it isn't just about lower taxes. We also need a more positive attitude to risk taking. Let's start with one of the most public risks taken this year. Richard Branson, his team and the UK Space Agency deserve massive credit for getting Launcher One off the ground in Cornwall. The mission may not have succeeded this time, but what we learn from it will make future success more likely. And we should heed the words of Thomas Edison who said, I haven't failed 10,000 times, I've successfully found 10,000 ways that will not work. Edison was American, and our attitude to risk in this country can still be too cautious compared to our US friends. But we are capable of smart risk-taking in this country. At the start of the pandemic, we bought over 350 million doses of vaccine without knowing if they would actually work. And we ended up with one of the fastest, most effective vaccine programs in the world. We also need, if we're going to deliver those competitive enterprises, smarter regulation. Brexit's an opportunity not just to change regulations, but also to work with our experienced, effective and independent regulators to create an economic environment which is more innovation friendly and more growth focused. Our chief scientific advisor, Sir Patrick Valance, is currently reviewing how the UK can better regulate emerging technologies in high growth sectors. And the government's identifying where to reform the laws we inherited from the EU. In the digital space, Sir Patrick is working with the brilliant Matt Clifford, who we heard from earlier, and our amazing culture secretary, Michelle Donnellan, both of whom gave excellent speeches. Before we conclude those findings, we want to hear from you, and that's why we've invited you this morning. Uh, and we'll repeat that process for green industries, life sciences, creative industries, and advanced manufacturing. Finally, when it comes to the E of enterprise, there is a critical need for easier access to capital, particularly scale-ups. I'm supporting important changes to the pensions regulatory charge cap, I've used the regulatory flexibility provided by Brexit to change the Solvency II regulations, which will begin to be implemented in the coming months. Alongside other measures announced in the Edinburgh reforms, this could unlock over £100 billion of additional investment into the UK's most productive growth industries. But there's much more to be done, and I want to harness the ideas and expertise in this room to turn the E of enterprise into an enterprise culture built on low taxes, reward for risk, access to capital, and smarter regulation. Now the next E is education. And this is an area where we have made dramatic progress in recent years, thanks to the work of successive conservative education ministers. The UK has risen nearly 10 places in the global school league tables for maths and reading since 2015 alone. Our teachers and lecturers are some of the very best in the world. As the Prime Minister said, having a good education system is the best economic, moral and social policy any country can have. And that's why in the autumn statement, we gave schools an extra £2.3 billion of funding and why the Prime Minister recently prioritised the teaching of maths until 18. But there is much to improve. We don't do nearly as well for the 50% of school leavers who don't go to university as we do for the ones who do. We have around 9 million adults with low basic literacy or numeracy skills, over 100,000 people leaving school every year unable to reach the required standard in English and maths. And that matters. We are becoming an adaptive economy in which people are likely to have to train for not one, but several jobs in their working lives. Not having basic skills in reading and maths makes that difficult, sometimes impossible. And equally important is what happens beyond school. 
We've made progress with T-levels, boot camps and apprenticeships. And Sir Michael Barber is advising the government on further improvements for the implementation of our reform agenda. And we want to ensure our young people have the skills that they would get in Switzerland or Singapore. If we want to reduce dependence on migration and become a high skill economy, the E of education will be essential. And that means ensuring opportunity is as open to those who don't go to university as to those who do. So, Silicon Valley enterprises, Finnish and Singaporean education and skills. Let me now turn to the third E, which is employment. If companies can't employ the staff they need, they can't grow. High employment levels have long been a strength of our economic model. Since 2010, we have seen a record employment rate, the lowest unemployment in nearly 50 years, and labor market participation at an all-time high. Partly thanks to the coalition reforms of a decade ago, we are at 76% employment levels higher than Canada, the US, France, or Italy. But the pandemic has exposed weaknesses in our model. Total employment is nearly 300,000 people lower than pre-pandemic, with around one-fifth of working-age adults economically inactive. Excluding students, that amounts to 6.6 .6 million people, an enormous and shocking waste of talent and potential. Of that 6.6 .6 million people, around 1.4 million want to work but a further five million don't. So it's time for a fundamental program of reforms to support people with long-term conditions or mental illness to overcome the barriers, that prejudice, the barriers and prejudices that prevent them from working. We will never harness the full potential of our country unless we unlock it for each and every one of our citizens. Nor will we fix our productivity puzzle unless everyone who can participate does. So to those who retired early after the pandemic or haven't find, found the right role after furlough, I say Britain needs you and we will look at the conditions necessary to make work worth your while. That's why employment is such a vital third E. Enterprise, education, employment. Three key components for our long-term prosperity. And I conclude with my final E, everywhere. That means ensuring the benefits of economic development are felt not just in London and the Southeast, but across the whole of the UK. It is socially divisive if young people feel the only way to make a decent living is to head south. But it's also economically damaging. If our second cities were the productive powerhouses we see in other major countries, our GDP would be nearly 5% higher, making us second only to the United States and Germany for GDP per head. And that's why levelling up really matters, and why last week it was so exciting to see the progress being made. Since February 2020, when the levelling up agenda really got underway, 70% of new employed jobs have been created outside London and the Southeast. Thanks to our powerhouse regions, we remain one of the top 10 manufacturers globally. And the same is starting to happen with new industries, whether FinTech in Bristol, gaming in Dundee, clean energy in Teesside. Every region has seen pay grow faster than London since 2010, which shows that our approach to regional growth is working but there's much more to do. And whilst government grants can play a galvanizing role, they aren't the whole answer. We also need the connectivity that comes from better infrastructure. That's why in the autumn statement, we protected key projects like HS2, East-West Rail, and Core Northern Powerhouse Rail. Digital connectivity 
matters as well, which is why under Michelle's Okay, the UK Chancellor Jeremy Hunt there outlining his growth plans for the British economy in his speech here at Bloomberg's European headquarters in London. You can, of course, continue watching it on live. Go. A couple of key lines that jumped out of this speech then. The UK Chancellor saying that the best tax cut right now is a cut in inflation, saying that the plan for growth will require patience and discipline, and repeating that he wants the UK to become the next Silicon Valley, saying he was outlining a framework for policies going forward. Jamie Rush, our chief European economist, is still with us. Jamie, your key takeaways, your key response, your reaction to this? Uh, well, I mean, I, I share the Chancellor's enthusiasm about the capacity for the UK to be at the forefront of, of innovation. That's like, certainly true. Uh, and there are some laudable aims, aims there. But I think what was missing from the speech was that, that all the other businesses which are being left behind on the productivity side. We have a big, long tail of low productivity businesses. And if you really want to lift living standards of everybody, you need to target that, that, that tail of, of the distribution. Um, other thing that struck me was just the, the open goal that is halving inflation. Mm. Um, you know, with energy costs where they are, you could put a suckling pig in charge of the country and it'd still <laughs> halve by September. So I think, you know, they set themselves up for success as they measure it there. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's, okay, there's a lot in there. That, that's a wonderful image. Uh, Jamie, uh, thank you for your analysis as well, of course, on the back of that speech from the UK Chancellor. And of course, we are going to have a lot more from the UK Chancellor, Jeremy Hunt. You're going to be, we are going to be speaking, Anna Edwards will be speaking to the Chancellor on Bloomberg TV. That conversation at 10.30 a.m. UK time. Do tune in for that. The pound, by the way, is weaker, currently at 123, down three-tenths of a percent. The FTSE 100 trading up by two-tenths of a percent. Futures in the US lower by three-tenths on the S&P e -mini. Stay with us. This is Bloomberg. When we look at what's happening with the consumer, which is the backbone of the U.S. economy, we are seeing a clear loss of momentum. We are yet to see the earnings recession that is supposed to bring us into a recession. And this is simply because of inflation. You've got to get to a point where inflation doesn't keep rearing its head. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition with Anna Edwards, Matt Miller and Kaylee Lines. It's 10 a.m. in London, 5 a.m. in New York and 6 p.m. in Hong Kong, our top stories today. Intel comes out with one of its gloomiest forecasts ever. The chipmaker has been hammered by a slump in the personal computer business. The sell-off in the Adani empire has now erased more than $50 billion in value. Asia's richest man is struggling to contain the fallout from a scathing report by a U.S. short seller. And the UK Chancellor, Jeremy Hunt, pushes back against the gloom over the UK economy. Bloomberg has an interview with Jeremy Hunt coming up this hour. Welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Anna Edwards in London with Matt Miller in New York. Kaylee Lines will be hosting the US Market Close show today. Uh, so, Matt, I'm going to be speaking to Jeremy Hunt a little bit later on this hour. He's busy setting out his plans, his vision for the UK economy. Uh, so that's going to be a big feature of our programme. Yeah, I saw um, his speech, and things look fantastic from his point of view for the UK economy. So I'm interested to see what he has to say when you interview him in just about 20 minutes' time from now. In terms of what's going on in markets, we know that China is still shut. So let's take a look at the rest of Asia, because there is some movement there, notably in the Sensex. You talk about the Adami story, and we're going to talk about that a little bit later. But it is weighing on Indian stocks right now. The Sensex down about 1.5%. It's off its session lows. Um, but still a significant drop here. We see the Nikkei unchanged um, at the close in Japan and the dollar a little bit weaker against the yen right now at 129.87. Uh, so just below the 130 mark there. Take a look at what's going on in terms of U.S. futures after the big rally that we had in the cash trade yesterday. Gains of more than 1% on the Dow, the S&P 500 and the NASDAQ. S&P futures now down about one third of 1% um, to kick off the final trading day of the week. U.S. 10-year uh, yields also uh, rising a little bit, almost five basis points now, up to 354. So finally a little bit of movement in that number. Also movement in crude. It had been stuck around $80. Now it's up at $82.06, a gain of about 1.3%. And Bitcoin um, holding steady at just about 23000 so $22,952 a piece. What do you see in terms of the European moves? 
Yeah, well, we've actually managed to shrug off a little bit of the early weakness that we did see on European stocks, Matt. So we opened neg pretty negatively, at least in the first half hour of trade, and regaining a little bit of that. Of course, we're dealing with the earnings story right in the midst of the, uh, the earnings deluge for European corporates, and that's weighing in here as well. The FTSE 100 up at, uh, an eighth of a percent or so, as is the CAC Caron. The DAX is fairly flat. Energy is uh, one sector that is in focus today. Energy stocks actually moving higher, and Brent crude is uh, partly the reason for that, up by 1.3%, slowly, slowly making those moves higher. 88.57 is where we trade on the price of a barrel of Brent crude right now. These are some really interesting uh, stories that we have for you right now. H&M is in focus, down by 6% uh, in today's session. And actually, the retail sector under pressure as a result of the numbers out of H&M. Surging costs is part of the story here. So because they make a lot of their clothes over in Asia, the shipping costs got so high that bringing those into other markets globally has proven to be an expensive business. And so they're looking for sources of material, sources of, uh, of product that are a little nearer to home. Uh, Sainsbury, also worth a mention, up by 4.5%. This is the grocery business here in the UK, and that stock is on the rise. We've heard from one of the other uh, operators, a convenience store operator called Bestway. Uh, they're buying 3.45% off Sainsbury's. No plan to, to make an offer for the business as yet, but certainly that's put some M&A speculation and fire under the stock this morning. We will keep our eye, of course, uh, on UK grocers, but really the big story for markets is chips. Intel shares falling today. The chip maker gave one of the glue gloomiest forecasts in its history after a personal computer slump hammered its business. CEO Pat Gelsinger spoke after the company released its results. I want to remind everyone that we are on a multi-year journey. We remain focused on the things that are within our control as we navigate short-term headwinds while executing to our long-term strategy. Bloomberg Quick Takes' Alex Webb joins us now to talk about what's driving the incredible declines. Really, Alex, if they hit the low end of their sales forecast, it'll be the worst quarter for sales since 2010. Yeah, the market had been expecting a, a March quarter with sales in the order of 14.5 billion. Intel forecast between 10.5 and 11.5 billion. Massive, massive miss on that. And it's really to do with demand for personal computers that we saw quite a lot of purchasing of electronics during the lockdowns. People needed them as they worked from home. Some people had a bit more disposable income. That front loaded a lot of demand for electronics. Now there's a lot of inventory build up amongst customers, i.e., the companies that make these laptops, desktops, and so on. Intel is really feeling that pain. It has been hemorrhaging um, share to the likes of TSMC in recent years, and uh, it's going to take some time before they are able to compete again. OK, so that's the story out of Intel. Sticking with the chip story then, Alex, uh, we've heard that the US is persuading the Netherlands and Japan to uh, make a move. It's poised to join US efforts to keep China away from some of the most advanced technology on chips. Why is this significant? Yeah, I mean, it is a massive deal. It's quite hard to underplay how significant this is. We've seen the US in recent years really crack down on the supply of high-end chips themselves to China, to the likes of, of Huawei, preventing them from getting them into their devices. That then reinvigorated Chinese efforts to come up with their own technology. So what the US is now doing is make it hard to sell the equipment that can make the chips. And it's not just the next generation equipment, which is called extreme ultraviolet lithography, makes sort of three to seven nanometer circuits on, on semiconductors, but also the last generation. So it really throttles China's ability to make the chips they need to drive things like AI applications. Alex, thanks very much. Alex Webb joining us there from Bloomberg Quick Take. Now, shares of Adani Group companies are continuing to tumble after the short seller Hindenburg Research published a report accusing the firms of fraud. The losses accelerated even after Adani disputed the allegations in a call with bondholders. Bloomberg's PR uh, Sanjay joins us now from Mumbai. So Adani continues to push back against this, uh, this narrative from Hindenburg, uh, PR Sanjay. Uh, what is the latest in Adani's fight back? It's, it's failing to persuade investors right now, but we are hearing from and expect to hear more from the Adani group. So Adani Group, has, uh, uh, on, on Wednesday itself, they've uh, uh, issued a rebuttal. Uh, the CFO has come on uh, television, they've uh, circulated a, a video, and they issued a statement. And yesterday, it was a market holiday for India. The, the legal head also issued a statement threatening uh, Hindenburg uh, research that it will uh, go for uh, legal solutions in the, under Indian laws as well as U.S. laws. But uh, we are expecting a point-to-point -point rebuttal, a more detailed one from Adani Group. Uh, indeed, uh, yesterday, Adani had uh, issued an 18-page rebuttal to bondholders and investors. But we are expecting a detailed one which can uh, save some bit of uh, uh, foreign offer, which is seeking to raise $2.5 billion from the market, which is started on 25th of January. And uh, today, they will... Uh, reach out to retail investors, which will end on 31st January. Okay, thank
Thanks very much, PR Sanjay. We'll leave the conversation there. The line a little bit, uh, a little bit difficult. Uh, joining us there from Mumbai, hot on the heels of this story. No doubt but more from the team in Mumbai on this story as it develops. Now, the UK Chancellor Jeremy Hunt has been speaking in this very building this morning, outlining his plans for growth and pushing back against calls for tax cuts. Joining us now is Bloomberg's chief Europe economist, Jamie Rush. And Jamie, he is still speaking, I think, and uh, still talking about what he sees as the opportunities for the UK economy right now. What has stood out for you, having a few moments to digest some of the themes he's been talking about? Um, well, I, so I think one of the things is that, you know, I completely share his enthusiasm about the, the, the capacity for the UK to be at the forefront of innovation. Well, that's certainly true. Um, historically, we haven't monetized it that well, and so efforts in that space are, are important. But what was missing from the speech was an acknowledgement that there's a huge tail of low productivity firms uh, which aren't benefiting. And you really need to bring those businesses along with us mm. across the country. And productivity has been an issue for decades. We've talked about it a lot. Yeah. I mean, are there any new answers? I mean, I think that's, I th I think that's part of it, is that it's not just focusing on startups and scaling. It's also just bringing up all the, all the other companies too. So there's something missing there. Um, the other thing that struck me was that, you know, we've had the Inflation Reduction Act in the US, which is a huge green package of green subsidies. Um, I got no sense from the speech that anything's being cooked up in the UK, which means, of course, we're at risk of being left behind. Thus, uh, so that's, that's a worry. Th thus far, it looks to outsiders, I have to say, Jamie, like Brexit has been damaging, as if you've really shot yourselves in the foot. However, Hunt says it's an opportunity and he can make it an incredible success. What's he basing that on? Um, so I think, you know, Brexit has afforded some some flexibility on, on, on adjusting some of the regulatory environment in the UK. So I imagine he's appealing to that logic. I think when you look at the, uh, the facts, though, uh, the UK economy is about 4% smaller uh, since 2016 than, than, the G7, than our G7 peers. Like, we just haven't caught up on growth. And a lot of that is just because business investment has been incredibly weak. Um, the UK is not, with the, the uncertainty we've seen and the lack of market access, it's just not as an attractive place to invest. All right, we're going to uh, continue to hear more from Jeremy Hunt. As Anna said, he's still speaking. Uh, right now he's talking about some concerns um, that the U.K. has about the U.S. Inflation Reduction Act. Those concerns are shared by his European peers, so it'll be interesting to see what he has to say about that in just a moment. Anna sits down for an interview with the U.K. Chancellor of the Exchequer in just about 15 minutes' time. Now let's take a look at some of the stocks we're watching in the pre-market Today, um, Intel is one of the big ones. I mention it again because it's such a huge mover um, in regards to the, the entire sector. It's bringing down chip equipment provider KLA as well as advanced micro devices and NVIDIA and Micron and AMAT and every chip maker that you look at in the U.S. pre-market is trading down in sympathy with Intel after it gave um, an incredibly dour forecast uh, for the current quarter, missing analyst estimates and bringing sales possibly back down to a level we haven't seen in over a decade. Now, Buzz, BuzzFeed is extending its rally after a report that that company would rely on chat GPT creator OpenAI to help create some of its content. So uh, moving, I guess, away from journalists and towards artificial intelligence. And then Bed Bath & Beyond is edging ever closer to a bankruptcy filing after receiving a default notice from its loan agent. We see the stock actually up in the pre-market, but it's only trading at $2.50 a share. Anna? Yeah, chat GPT certainly everywhere right now. Two of the speakers at this morning's Treasury event uh, deciding to start their speech with uh, lines that were provided to them from chat GPT. It is a sign of the times in 2023. Uh, coming up on this programme, Hans Olsen joins us, Chief Investments Officer at Fiduciary Trust. That'll be a conversation around the broader markets looking ahead to the year. And we'll get back to Intel's disappointing earnings with William DeGale, Lead Portfolio Manager for Technology at Blue, Bank, uh, Blue Box Asset Management. What does uh, he make of the assessment of this quarter. That seems to be in particular what's weighing on the business. A long-term story, says the company. Now, don't miss our interview with the UK Chancellor of the Exchequer, Jeremy Hunt, coming up later this hour. This is Bloomberg.
season is here. Big banks, that was the big story. From the big banks to big tech. Everybody is losing a lot of money. It's a question of how high the bar is set. Bloomberg breaks the numbers first. A blockbuster number. Blowing through estimates. These guys are minting money. With exclusive expert analysis. Does this approach make sense to you? We're going to have to make an acquisition. Does this quickly become just a really crappy business model? I don't think their business is as broken as the world thinks. Bloomberg Television and Radio. The fastest numbers and analysis you trust. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Matt Miller in New York with Anna Edwards in London. Kaylee Lyons will be hosting the U.S. market close show later on today. Now let's get to the Bloomberg Markets reporter Valerie Titel. Valerie, you're looking at the recent Treasury auctions. In January, apparently one of the best months ever for auction demand. Why are uh, Treasury so hot right now? Yeah, one of the best months we've ever seen for the Treasury auction market. Now, I think this really reflects the, the sentiment out there with investors that these yields might not be around for much longer. We had a, a slew of Treasury auctions this week and all month that all sold below the prevailing market yield at that time, reflecting that just a heavy demand, even the indirect bidding made some all-time records, broke a few all-time records in that regards. Now, all of this is kind of reflecting that, yes, we are predicting the turn of the U.S. business cycle and, and perhaps with it the turn of the Fed. There's been a lot of dovish trades that have gone on in the front end. I want to take you through a, a few through a few of them. Uh, they've been quite chunky this week, uh, positioning for things like a 20 basis point rally next week. We have the Fed meeting as well as the payroll report. Positioning for a Fed pause in March. Positioning for 200 basis points of cuts out until December. And a very, very chunky yield curve steepener went through this week. That's again positioning for a possible Fed cut past neutral, leading that inversion of the curve to flip very, very quickly uh, uh, into, into steepening territory. All right, Valerie, thanks very much for that. Valerie Titel talking to us about Treasuries. Joining us to talk further is Hans Olsen, Chief Investment Officer at Fiduciary Trust. Um, Hans, what do you think about the shift in sentiment we've seen and the slowdown we're now expecting from the Fed? I think it's wishful thinking, Matt. Uh, at this juncture, it's hard to see how, why the Fed should uh, back away from its program. Of, of normalizing interest rates, number one, and inflation is not completely out of the economy. I, I think you know we're going to see later this morning the uh, the core PCE deflator, which is supposed to come in on a month over month uh, basis of zero percent, based on what we saw in the the economy yesterday with the fourth quarter GDP being stronger than expected. I'm not so sure, but we shouldn't be surprised if uh, that number comes in that de uh, deflator number comes in higher than expected which would kind mm. of ruin the setup for that trade. Yes, uh, it would ruin what a lot of people are thinking about. And maybe a lot of people's thoughts about the economy hands were ruined yesterday by that claims number. Robust labour market in the United States once again in evidence, despite everything that the Fed has thrown at the US economy. Given that data backdrop, as we head towards the Fed, what is your assumption for how long rates stay as high as they are? I mean, high by recent standards, at least. Yeah, yeah, high by recent standards, but... Pro but you know, uh, ultimately, the question is, where do they settle in? What's the what's the relationship between the price of money and the price of things, right? Or the real rate of money? Um, and we're still probably nowhere near. Well, not probably. We certainly are nowhere near where it needs to be at the moment. Um, I think they're going to they're going to they're going to stay with the program until the job is done, and the job is not done, which means that we could see um, uh, the, the the central bank holding the line on rates through the end of the year. Um, so I'm not expecting any of the, this pivot or sort of Goldilocks scenario that, uh, uh, that, that you see playing out in the bond market right now. OK, so no pivot, no Goldilocks, but you do see opportunities in stocks then, but under new leadership, so not thanks to the tech, uh, the tech sector. That's right. I, we're seeing a rotation uh, in leadership from these favored stocks of the last four or five years to more of the average stock. And, and, and one of the things that really stands out is the, you know, if you compare the performance of the equal weighted S&P 500 to the market cap weighted, that's, that's 
pretty note notable the uh, uh, the difference between the two, and I think we'll see more of that, which leads you to sort of what is old is new again, sort of the the more mature companies uh, with uh, uh, better profits or or more a higher quality balance sheet, um, more value orientation indeed. But you you'll see it in the industrial sector, you'll see it in the energy sector, materials and the like. Will we start to see more job cuts from those companies? We saw them from 3M a couple of days ago. We're seeing job cuts at IBM. Do you expect to see job cuts seep into the older economy? I, I do, Matt, somewhat. I think the the we saw the the hiring boom of the last several years perhaps was overdone. So there, the people are cutting back from overstaffing levels, which could be the uh, you know the, the the bit that forces the uh, the economy into recession. But I do think. Um, when you look at the number of, of jobs that are being put up every month right now, relative to the layoffs, uh, we're still putting on about four times as many jobs as there are announced layoffs on a monthly basis. So, uh, you know, the labor market's still, still in pretty fine fettle. Looks tight, maybe not strong. What do you think about the depth of the recession or the length of the recession um, that you expect, Hans? I mean, We've seen, for example, a huge buildup in inventories, which a lot of economists told us yesterday um, are going to lead to even slower growth than we anticipated. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, you know, I think the probability of recession, certainly the bond market is screaming it uh, in terms of what the yield curve suggests, although the credit market's perhaps less so. I was looking at high yield spreads, uh, the OAS there, and and that doesn't, you know, there's doesn't suggest any sort of dislocation. Um, if we have a recession, if we have a recession, my expectation that it would be probably much more mild than, um, um, uh, you know, people are used to, right? So if, we, if, our, if our reference point is the, you know, the last re uh, recession for the, the pandemic or the recession before that, uh, I think this is going to be something much, much smaller and perhaps, um, perhaps even shorter. So if someone comes to you with a significant amount of, of, of cash right now, um, what do you do? Do you wait? Is there a point at which you invest? Do you dollar cost average in? Yeah, there is some foot dragging right now, right? Because the the run that we've seen in the market, I think, uh, is a a counter trend rally. So it's a you know bull market rally in short. So I think there's a very good possibility that we will um, we're going to retest the lows that we saw last year. We possibly could w could punch through those lows down into 3,200, 3,300. That none of that would surprise me at all. So we're building out European exposures first right now. Uh, we'll be going after those average stocks in the U.S., uh, start to layer that in. Um, we're keeping duration short. Uh, and and we're, we're playing a, a, an optimistic but a defensive posture at the moment. And, and then, we still uh, are carrying above average levels of cash. And then in terms of uh, fixed income, you mentioned um, high yield isn't screaming, uh, credit isn't screaming recession right now. Are there pockets there that you like as well? Yeah, not yet, not yet. There, it, It's simply... Um, uh, the transaction is not fair, right, for the investor. I think the yield spreads are up, what, 460? They're about 460 basis points over. Uh, for me to get terribly interested in high yield or something like that, we'd have to see those up six, seven, eight hundred in order for us to uh, be inclined to take a, uh, take a, 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 a hard look or indeed commit capital. To that. Hans, let me finally ask you about China, because the reopening there has spurred some to forecast a huge jump in commodities prices. Others say it's going to be offset by what we see in the U.S. and Europe. What's your view of the China reopening? Oh, I think it's, 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 it's real and it's going to happen. It'll probably be bumpy, as we've seen with when they, when they lifted the, when Xi lifted the, uh, the COVID restrictions, you know, COVID tore through the country. I, I, that's probably not over. Winter's not over. Um, but I think that that's real, and that's why we've gotten more uh, constructive on Europe, especially countries like Germany, that are much more tied to um, uh, you know the, uh, the the Chinese economy. So I think that's real. That's going to play out over the course of the year, and that will be a, a catalyst for uh, higher resource prices, higher energy prices, um, for sure. 
Hans, it's always great, always great to get some time with you. Thank you so much for waking up early uh, for us this morning. Hans Olsen there is the Chief Investment Officer of Fiduciary Trust. Now let's keep you up to date with news from around the world. Here's the first word. Bloomberg has learned that Vladimir Putin is planning a new offensive in Ukraine. The Russian president also is preparing his country for a conflict with the U.S. and its allies that he expects to last for years. The Kremlin wants to show its forces can regain the initiative after months of losing ground. It's hoping to force Ukraine and its backers to agree to some kind of truce. The International Monetary Fund is considering an aid package for Ukraine worth as much as $16 billion. Bloomberg's learned that there are still a number of conditions, including endorsement from the Group of Seven Nations. Ukraine's government also would need to commit to a series of policies in order to uh, uh, get that money. And a new survey of economists says that Europe the European Central Bank, the ECB, will go for two interest rate hikes of 50 basis points each on its way to a May peak in rates. Then, according to the survey, the deposit rate will be held at three and a quarter percent for about one year. Economists expect a struggling economy will eventually lead the ECB to cut rates, a pivot for Europe. Bloomberg has learned that House Republicans are considering a short-term extension of the federal debt ceiling until September 30th. That would give it more time to resolve an impasse with Democrats, but it's not clear if the Democratic-controlled Senate would agree. For now, accounting maneuvers could avert reaching the limit until July or even later. Well, if you listen to Joe Weisenthal with a trillion dollar coin, it could be a long time. Goldman Sachs warns that the next sanctions on Russia, on Russian oil, are likely to be more disruptive. The new penalties take effect next month. Among other things, they'll impact diesel fuel. Russian diesel exports accounts for 15% of total global flows. Now coming up next, Anna Edwards speaks with the UK Chancellor of the Exchequer, Jeremy Hunt, from Bloomberg's European headquarters in London. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. Here's what you need to know. Intel comes out with one of its gloomiest forecasts of all time. The chip maker has been hammered by a slump in the personal computer business. And the sell-off in the Adani empire has now erased more than $50 billion in value. Asia's richest man is struggling to contain the fallout from a scathing report by a U.S. short seller. And Jeremy Hunt, the UK Chancellor of the Exchequer, pushes back against the gloom over the UK economy. Bloomberg has an interview with Hunt in just moments from now. Anna Edwards uh, sitting down with Jeremy Hunt. Let's get a check first on what's going on in the markets globally. We see futures here in the U.S. down as Intel uh, really sour sentiment for chip makers. Um, the rally that we've seen in Intel, it's up, I think, 12, uh, 13 percent year to date could be completely erased by today's drop. And then you're seeing a number of other chip makers drop uh, with it or anybody connected to chips from NVIDIA to applied materials to uh, AMD to uh, Micron, et cetera. The U.S. 10-year yield rising a little bit more than four basis points, 420 just briefly, so that was fun. 353.67 is the level we're looking at, uh, going out five significant digits. And then Brent crude, as well as the entire crude complex, putting up some gains today, a little more than 1%. 88.44 a barrel, and we're seeing NYMEX West Texas Intermediate trade over $82 a barrel. So some real movement to the upside for the commodities. Finally, stocks in Europe were down earlier today, are now rising uh, just a bit, four one hundredths of 1% on the Stocks Europe 600 index. Um, so some gains there, uh, not beaten down as much by the chip sector, which is more prevalent in U.S. indexes. Speaking of those 
chips, uh, Intel predicting a surprise loss in this current quarter, also saying that sales could be the worst since 2010. Uh, the shares falling 9% in the pre-market. We'll continue to um, give you the latest on Intel as we get closer and closer to the cash trade this morning. BuzzFeed uh, gaining 20%, saying it's going to have chat GT GPT uh, help to write some of its content. Um, and that is, I guess, the, um, the touch word of the day for markets. It's the new blockchain, chat GPT. So BuzzFeed trading up to 252. And then Bed Bath & Beyond gaining another 1%. But of course, it's only at 255 itself, edging closer and closer to a bankruptcy filing after receiving a default notice from its loan agent. Now let's get back though to our main story for the hour. UK Chancellor Jeremy Hunt joins Anna Edwards for an interview in just moments after outlining his plans for growth earlier in a keynote speech. Bloomberg's chief Europe economist Jamie Rush joins us now to talk about what to expect uh, from the interview. Jamie, what do we hear in the Chancellor's speech just moments ago at our European headquarters in London? Well, I think we've heard a lot about the framework that the government is using as it sets out policy to deliver stronger growth. Um, what we haven't heard yet is, in, is much specific on, on, the, on the policies that are coming down the line. Uh, and we're probably going to have to wait till March for that. A um, couple of things I would like to hear more about are what is the government going to do for the, the long tail of low productivity firms in this country? How, how are they going to uh, raise productivity in, in that crucial element of the, uh, of the economy? Uh, and also just a bit more on the, on the Inflation Reduction Act uh, and the UK's response to it. We know that in the US there's a huge package of green subsidies uh, that's going to suck investment uh, across the pond. I uh, wouldn't know how the, the EU is probably cooking something up. It'd be great to know what the UK is thinking about this. D does the UK, Jamie, join with Europe in such measures? I mean, post-Brexit, is that still going to be something, the kind of thing they can do together? Uh, I would say probably not. Um, I think, you know, there's, a, there are, there's nothing that's going to be solved on, on, the, on, on the European side, I think, uh, until we have the, the Northern Ireland Protocol uh, uh, fixed. So I think that, you know, there's, there's a big roadblock there for cooperation with Europe. And until that's unblocked, there's not going to be cooperation of the level that we would like to see. Nonetheless, the Chancellor seemed really very upbeat about Brexit. Um, how has the UK economy fared in relation to, say, uh, European peers since the vote and since the move? Well, I mean, I think since, since 2Q16, the UK economy has had a growth shortfall relative to G7 peers of about 4%. So really quite a material difference in the, in the growth performance there. Uh, and when you look at some of the reasons behind that, Business investment is massively lower than, uh, than it has been elsewhere, like a 20% shortfall in growth in that area of the economy. Um, partly uncertainty around, around Brexit. Um, if we can lift that, then maybe that's one route through to, uh, to faster growth. One of the um, platforms, the Bo Bojo platforms, I always found very interesting was the idea of leveling up. And I wonder um, how that has fared thus far. How are other... Uh, areas, regions in England and the UK doing compared to, I guess, the home counties when it comes to economic growth? I, mean, I, I think the, the progress on levelling up has actually been extremely limited. Um, we haven't seen uh, any convergence, really, of incomes or of, uh, of, of prospects. And, you know, this is a, this is a multi-year, probably multi-decade problem that needs to be addressed, and we're not going to see fast results, unfortunately. Um, but from what I've seen at the moment, the, I mean, the, the levelling up agenda hasn't quite uh, delivered uh, even the policies, I think, which would be required to, to move the needle at all. Well, I heard an amazing fact on Bloomberg Radio this morning. Um, one quarter of UK home sales in uh, the fourth quarter were done without a real estate agent because uh, the prices have taken such a hit. Nobody wants to lose any more money on fees. How is the real estate situation in the UK right now? And has, has the Chancellor addressed it? Has the government uh, looked at this situation? I mean, I think there's probably quite a bit more bad news to come on UK housing. I mean, if you look at assets globally, they've all repriced to the, the higher long-term interest rate environment, right? Um, that's not something we've seen with residential property yet. Uh, so the question really is, if this revaluation occurs, is it going to happen very fast? Are we going to see outright drops in prices? 
uh, or is it just going to be a period of, of slow growth in prices? And for, for me, I, I would guess that the that house prices are probably going to drop quite substantially in the UK, simply responding to this uh, huge increase in mortgage costs that, you know, it's not UK specific, but uh, is, is facing, being faced by people across Europe. For, for all the bad news in the UK economy, Jamie, the pound has really recovered quite well since it's dropped to parity. What's your outlook for the currency and what are the big effects that play into it? So I, mean, I think, I mean, generally speaking, we think of the divergent monetary policy outlooks as being the main driver of short-term moves in, in the currency, um, except, of course, around the period of the mini-budget in the UK, which, was, uh, which saw a disastrously high premium placed uh, on the risk premium on UK assets. Um, that has now eroded, as far as we can see. Uh, and so what's, in the, what's de determining the outlook really is what the Bank of England is going to do relative to what the Fed is going to do. Uh, and while, where we've heard that the Fed is probably perhaps becoming a little bit more dovish, or at least that's the market perception, um, the Bank of England can't really afford to be yet because wage growth is still running at about 7%, well above what's consistent with the inflation target being met in the medium term. Uh, and so, you know, we're, gonna, we're looking for a 50 basis point hike next week when the Bank of England meets. From the outside, I'd say, Jamie, it just looks so grim in the UK. I imagine, um, you know, trains not running because of strikes, wait times at the NHS uh, going weeks long, inflation for, uh, you know, your average pint, like 10 percent. And um, I wonder what the actual consumer sentiment is like within the UK. How do consumers feel about the economy right now? I mean, so, I mean, the, the economy, we have problems, you know, we, as, you, as you just listed, we have some serious problems. Um, but the economy has actually been surprisingly resilient to the energy crisis uh, this year. Uh, the, the, you know, the activity hasn't fallen off a cliff. Uh, we're not expecting uh, a big contraction in the fourth quarter. There's probably something coming over the next couple of quarters, maybe, a, a, but again, probably likely to be quite a shallow recession if, if there is one. Um, so actually, I'd say, one thing that has happened over the past month, which is buoying everyone's mood, is that there's just this profound drop in energy prices in wholesale markets. Uh, we've seen across Europe uh, a, a warmer winter. We've seen uh, households be pretty frugal. We've also seen industrial gas use just fall off a cliff without, without hitting production. And so all these things have driven the price of gas down, uh, driven down the price of electricity, and that's going to support the economy uh, over 2023 and you know the most most people are revising up their forecast both for the eurozone and for the uk finally jamie could you just explain to um, those of us who are not following the day-to-day -day moves on the northern ireland protocol H how does the government expect to solve this issue without putting a border in uh the sea and without putting a border to divide ireland and i think the, the the solution is going to require some flexibility on both sides I think that's the uh, that's the challenge, um, and you know, occasionally we get news that the uh, that the negotiations seem to be progressing. Um, maybe at some point in the, set, in the first half of this year, we'll, we'll we'll see something. But I mean, the key point though is that until that problem is resolved, it's just a huge roadblock for cooperation with the rest of Europe. And there's a lot of things which are important initiatives that really do need to be uh, thought about collectively. And uh, we're, you know, we're not at the table like the IRA. Jamie, thanks so much for your time. Really appreciate you sticking with us today. Bloomberg's chief Europe economist, Jamie Rush. Now let's get over to Anna Edwards. She sits down with UK Chancellor of the Exchequer, Jeremy Hunt. Anna? Matt, thank you very much. Yes, I'm very pleased to be speaking to the UK Chancellor of the Exchequer, Jeremy Hunt, who joins me here in the Bloomberg, uh, Bloomberg offices here in London. Very good to see you, Chancellor. Thank you so much for joining us. You've uh, uh, played down our expectations for tax cuts in the budget that is coming, but you've talked a lot about wanting to incentivise investment to get the economy growing. So let me start on investment. Um, the, the corporate tax rate is going to go up by six percentage points in April. At the time that that was announced, there was a lot of talk about specific reliefs that could be introduced to sort of soften the blow there. Is that something that you're going to be leaning on to try and encourage investment in the UK? Well, at the moment, we don't have the headroom for major tax cuts. But if I was going to prioritise where I would like to see tax cuts, um, it would be business tax cuts that 
give us, as I said in the speech, uh, uh, even more competitive tax rates. It's important to say, Anna, we have the second lowest business taxes as a proportion of GDP amongst major countries. So the UK mm. uh, is already very competitive, um, but we want to do better. And we recognise that taxes are part of the incentive structure that companies uh, react to when they decide where to invest. And my message this morning is very simple. If I was choosing where to invest uh, out of all the different places you can go in the world, when you look at Britain's strengths yes. in uh, green industries, in creative industries, in life sciences, in technology, I would choose Britain. Okay, so you want to incentivise investment in Britain. The, the truth, though, in recent years is that investment has been lagging behind the G7 average, and not just the G7 average, but all members of the G7. So what can you do to try and close that gap? You've ruled out big tax cuts, so what are the levers that you would look to be pulling? Well, I talked about uh, the four pillars uh, of my plan to improve our productivity. And if we deliver on that, if we become the most productive, as well as the most entrepreneurial country in Europe, I think we're already the most entrepreneurial, but this would make us the most productive, then I think that will make a very compelling case for investment. And that's why um, I outlined the plan. I think we've got a very exciting vision. I think we have the opportunity with our universities, our financial services, and our technology strengths to be a Silicon Valley. And um, I think that if I can make that happen, then I think this is the place people and are going to want to invest. that's what you want to encourage, to make a new Silicon Valley here. So are you looking at specific tax reliefs? Because, of course, uh, the super deduction runs out. This is, these are the kind of things that businesses want to, want to look ahead to. Can they, can they hope for that in March? I think, as I say, it is unlikely we will have the headroom to do that. What businesses want, they do want uh, to cut business taxes. Who wouldn't? I wanted that when I was running my own business. Um, but what businesses want even more than lower taxes is stability. Mm. And inflation is a fundamental thread of instability in the economy. It, uh, it's a worry for households. It stops them spending. Um, and it puts off businesses from investing. So the first thing we have to do is the Prime Minister's plan to halve inflation. Uh, that is going to require patience and discipline. Uh, when we are able to, no one wants to cut taxes more than I do, mm -hmm. but we have to recognise this is the priority for business as well as consumers right now. It's one of, it is one of the priorities that you've listed as a government. The US obviously worried about inflation there. They brought in their Inflation Reduction Act. Big subsidies in some shape or form for various industries there. You've said this morning that some elements of that policy worry you. Your colleague Grant Shapps described the policy as dangerous. What is it that worries the UK government about this policy? Well, we think that if we're going to have the transition to net zero, um, we should uh, benefit from free and open trade uh, between all the countries that share that ambition, because that will mean we'll get there more quickly, uh, more cost effectively than if we go it alone. Um, so we do have concerns, but we're also very optimistic that the UK will play a leading role in that clean energy transformation. Um, we get 40% of our electricity from renewables. Uh, we are second largest in Europe, the largest when it comes to offshore wind. Will we do our own subsidies, though? Well, um, we will announce our plans. I have absolutely no doubt that we will be able to present a package that makes us highly competitive. Um, but I don't think subsidy is necessarily the best way. I think what people want is creativity, innovation, mm. ideas, a climate, uh, a regulatory structure that encourages investment. And if you just look, Anna, at the transformation that we've had in the last 10 years since we started moving away from carbon to renewables, uh, we've done it without those huge subsidies. The US has got a bit of catch up to do because they had an administration that was very skeptical on climate change. Um, I, I think there's a way that the UK can do very well. Uh, is there not a danger, though, that we get squeezed in the middle of some kind of subsidy war? If the Americans throw $400 billion at this, if the Europeans are thinking about throwing 300 billion euros at this, how does the UK on its own stand up? Well, I think it's the wrong way to look at Britain right now to say we're so small and other places are so big. Because when it comes to innovation, nimbleness is a very big advantage and we have the opportunity to do things differently quickly uh, with new regulatory structures 
they can make a massive difference to investment in clean energy. Um, the meetings I've had since becoming Chancellor, I've heard of a, a wall of money that is waiting to invest in UK clean energy. And we just need to make sure that we unlock the barriers that are stopping mm. that happening. Part of the conversation we're having around subsidies is, of course, because we live in fast-changing geopolitical times and we seem to be shifting from a world that suited Britain, a, global, a very global world, a world of globalisation, to a world that is more multipolar. How does that sit with the UK's strategy? I, I would say that the change that we're seeing in the world is one that is a worry for not just Britain but for all democracies because we're seeing uh, the rise of more assertive autocracies who don't share our values um, and who tend to have a more mercantilist attitude to trade than we do. Um, and we need to work together with people who share the same values to try and stop that happening. And I think we're more than doing our, our share of that in terms of our contribution to the defence of Ukraine. Um, and that's important for business too. You've talked about this not being the time for big tax cuts, but we understand that there are members of your own party that are still calling for tax cuts. Uh, would it be idiotic to expect tax cuts at a time like this? We don't have the headroom And I ask for... it that way, of course, because the Prime Minister said that uh, the British people are not idiots and that they are not expecting to see tax cuts. So. Well, I think people do understand that we're in a very challenging fiscal situation, that the things haven't changed dramatically over the last three months since we delivered the autumn statement, which is only two months ago. We shouldn't expect there to be a huge change in the situation. Uh, but what I was saying today in my comments was that I recognise that lower taxes are part of the vital incentives that encourage people to set up businesses and to invest and we want to go there and the difference between us and the Labour Party is that Conservatives bring down taxes when they can, Labour never does and there is a fundamental difference in our positions. Chancellor, thank you very much, thanks for joining us, thank you for your time. Uh, the UK Chancellor of the Exchequer, Jeremy Hunt. Matt? Anna, thanks very much. Anna Edwards there with Hunt, the UK Chancellor of the Exchequer. So very interesting stuff. And we're going to continue to pour over the details of the developing uh, of the UK economy as they um, uh, develop today. Right now, I want to get back to the markets and to the global chip makers, shares around the world falling after Intel gave one of its gloomiest forecasts in its history. A personal computer slump has hammered its business, and at the low end of Intel's projections, revenue for this quarter would be the smallest since 2010. For more on the outlook for the industry, William DeGale joins us, lead portfolio manager for technology at Blue Box Asset Management. William, thanks so much for your time this morning. Uh, what has driven Intel to such a disappointing outlook? Have they just taken advantage of the negative sentiment to release what we would call a kitchen sink quarter? Yes, there could well be an element of that. Um, uh, I think that Intel has you know, some major stock-specific issues. So you shouldn't read what's happening to this one company as representing the entire chip industry. Uh, Intel is in a very, very difficult position. As, as you suggest, maybe they're making use of a sort of general negative uh, trend for, the, for other chip stocks to, to, to get some stuff out of the door. But I think mainly this is stock specific. And the PC market is clearly slowing down dramatically. Um, so, that certainly doesn't help Intel. So, William, what are, I mean, what are the general boxes into which um, we who are not tech analysts can put chip makers. I understand that the PC industry has taken a huge hit and companies that make chips for that segment are going to be big losers. On the other hand, there's still strong demand for companies who make or for chips um, made for, for, for automotive. So what are the main boxes or main buckets you throw chip makers into? Yeah, so so I think that the the bucket that's really important, which you're alluding to here, is is the stuff that's made on older equipment. So this is typically analog chips, microcontrollers, sensors. These are very sophisticated devices, but they don't need leading edge capacity. So they don't have to have the latest factories to make them. In fact, it's very difficult to make them. Uh, it's very inefficient to make them on the latest factories um, because shrinking these chips is very difficult. Um, so you tend to have more and more sophisticated designs, but those circuits can't get very much 
smaller easily. They're essentially made on, on equipment that was new in the 1990s or early 2000s, and, and no one's been building 1990s capacity since the 1990s. And demand for this stuff has been slowly growing for the last 15 years or more. Because every time you have a, a digital computer interacting with the real world, whether it's in a car or your personal devices or whatever, it has to have at least one analog chip to interpret between the digital world and the analog world that we live in. And it probably has thousands of them. And that interaction between computers and the real world has been growing dramatically over the last 15 years. So the demand for this type of chip, which no one thinks is very important, but actually absolutely vital, has been steadily growing for 15 years, and the capacity is pretty much limited. And we've hit that capacity limit. That's what happened two years ago. And it's very difficult to add more capacity at this end of the market without changing the economics of the business. So the suppliers are unwilling to do it because they'd have to buy new machines rather than old second-hand machines, which have all been used up. They're all running in use. So, so that end of the market looks very different from the, the PC end, the memory end, the cutting-edge digital that, end. That is where absolutely, that William, that is absolutely fascinating. How does that problem get solved? What's the solution? So I think that the businesses that, that need these chips are going to have to pay more for them. And they have been paying dramatically more for them, but sort of on a one-off basis on the last couple of years. They're chips that were very cheap, trading for huge multiples of their face price on, on sort of brokerage because they're in such short supply. What's really going to have to happen is that I think the price of this type of chip is going to have to rise to justify new expenditure. For example, you know, Texas Instruments has talked about building its first new fab for a very, very long time. They'll have to be paid for that. They're not going to do that unless someone pays them enough money to justify it. Some of that money will come from subsidies from the US government, from state governments, from governments elsewhere in the world. You know, there's huge subsidies going to this area. But some of it will have to come from the buyers. And I think that changes the economics for the trailing edge of the chip market or you know, the more mature nodes of the chip market. And that really is the really interesting bit for me. And you see this in for things like ASML and ASMI results. So these are companies that make the equipment to make chips on. And those two businesses have been seeing surprising strength not at the leading edge. It's come from the trailing edge, the older, the sort of deep ultraviolet or even older machines for ASML. And that's exactly what I'm talking about. The demand, the real tight bid is not the leading edge. It's the older equipment. So um, what, what's the takeaway from Intel itself? What's the solution there? Because um, if they're posting sales as low as they did back in 2010, that seems almost unturnaroundable. How are they going to deal with this? So I, I personally think they won't manage it. I mean, to be brutal, they've got an enormous problem. It's very difficult to see how they might succeed. And, you know, this is an interesting punt for someone, but it's not, not a risk I'd be taking in my portfolios. Um, they've got a huge issue. That, that, that Their enormous advantage in the past was this vast array of enormous fabs, the factories they make chips on, which were the best in the world by quite a long way. And they were designs of the chips they were making were very good as well. But it was almost impossible for anyone to compete with them because no one else had access to this, you know, unique uh, production resource but they got overtaken by tsmc a few years ago and you know their competitors such as amd and so on uh, are now shipless companies fabulous companies that are, are paying tsmc to provide them with leading edge equipment and the designs coming from these businesses are very good so what was intel's biggest advantage this huge you know installed base of, of capacity is now an enormous albatross behind around its neck mm. because it's no longer leading edge it needs to be upgraded and that's very very expensive William, thanks so much for your time. Really appreciate it. Uh, you, may, you managed to make the chip industry really, really interesting. So it's great to talk to you. William DeGale of Blue Box Asset Management talking to us about really the big story in markets today, which is uh, the terrible, horrible, no good quarter for Intel. And I think it's pretty ironic that we heard uh, Jeremy Hunt, the Chancellor of the Exchequer earlier, say that he wants to make uh, England kind of the new Silicon Valley since Silicon is having such a bad day. Let's bring Anna Edwards uh, back in after your interview there. There, Anna, um, Jeremy Hunt is positively optimistic. Why? Mm. Well, he's the Chancellor of the Exchequer. That's often what you get, I, I suppose. But, he, yeah, he's trying to make the pitch for the UK as an investment destination. The difficulty is for him, uh, Matt, that he doesn't have many levers to pull. When you look at the Inflation Reduction Act in the US and the expected response from Europe, is there a danger that the UK gets kind of stuck in the middle with not enough firepower, given the, uh, the limited room for manoeuvre he will have in terms of the budget? We'll hear from him around, uh, around March time with more detail on the budget. But he was certainly bringing down our expectations that we'll get anything like tax cuts. 
It does look like subsidies are going to be the answer for the U.S. and for the EU in terms of green investment, but not for the U.K. Yeah, I mean, he was talking about the difference in timing there. Maybe the U.S. has done less of it in the past, so maybe there's room for them to do more of it now. Uh, but that's certainly a conversation that's going to run and run very 2023. That is it for early edition. Surveillance is up ahead. They'll be hearing from PIMCO's Andrew Balls, among other voices. This is Bloomberg.